So, if you're wondering what all these weird squares of plastic are around our property, this is what we have learned. If you're new here, welcome. We live a little over 6,000 feet in elevation in the Wyoming mountains, and we're trying to build a little homestead on a place that is, uh, we were not fully aware when we bought it, but is covered in, we knew it was a rundown, abandoned former pasture, covering a good bit of garbage. We're still picking up broken glass and metal shards and stuff uh, four years later, but it also is covered in pretty much just quack grass when we started. Um, if you're not familiar with quack grass, it's a m invasive problem in cold climates. So places like Wyoming, I think some across the Dakotas and Minnesota, up in a lot of parts of Canada. Um, if you've been following along here, you have been watching our learning about it and figuring out how to fight it over nearly four years now. Um, it crowds things out physically by growing lots of aggressive rhizomes. It poisons them by releasing a chemical warfare agent that makes it very hard for other plants to grow in it. It strangles them by, in addition to crowding them, literally wrapping its roots in circles like, you know, uh, a stranglehold on stuff. And um, it makes it nearly impossible for other things to grow. People get it in a crop field, you can lose 80-90% of the crop and it's very hard to destroy because any little bit of those rhizomy roots that's left will regrow a whole new plant. So we have tried various things. I very naively planted trees like this lovely Honeycrisp apple um, four years ago. We planted the first ones. We've added some every year, but this is one of the oldest ones. And we dug a nice hole, mulched it nicely with wood chips out around it, made kind of a little berm so that we had a place to hold some water, a little bit of a individual tree swale kind of thing. And by the next spring we planted it in the fall, by the next spring there was some grass growing in. I've planted, you know, trees on lots of properties in my life before. Now I'll pull a few grasses out here. I mean, it's not going to hurt a tree. This thing's as tall as me. Um, boy, was I wrong. The grass invaded. I was going along weeding, thinking I was doing something good. You know, pull the grass out. You know, there's a few roots left. This was before I knew what quack, quack, quack grass was. Never heard of it. A um, few roots left, but you know, you pull the tops off of something, it's pretty much going to die. And certainly the tree's going to outcompete. I didn't care if there was some stuff growing around the bottom. I just didn't want the tree to die. Well, I learned that quack grass can kill trees. Um, it can, it's killed a lot of the trees and bushes we planted before we realized this. Then we started aggressively weeding it out. Then we started realizing that short of doing some kind of chemical control, which would obviously also kill the tree, um, and most chemicals also don't control it. Glyphosate, Roundup, etc. don't control it very well unless used very repeatedly. Um, we needed to do something else. So we started out by making, and we, I think we've got some videos of that too, making these cute little plastic squares around, or circles around the tree and holding that down and, you know, to keep the grass from going through. That worked, except they can run runners, we've learned, at least two feet in from an edge. So you need to have more than two feet in all directions to prevent them from just coming back into the tree and coming right up. Because all the stuff we did with those cute little circles, the grass ran right under and came back up. So this year, like I said, our oldest orchard trees here are four years old. And we did get some apples and a handful of cherries last year. And I'm not expecting much fruit from them yet anyway. Things grow pretty slow in our climate here with our short summers. But uh, we did this on a few things last year and it really worked. So this is pretty much what we have worked at from the time the snow first started to melt off some patches of ground in mid to late April through the end of June here. This is uh, catching up on protecting the plants that we already had planted before we knew about quackgrass has been a huge project and pretty much swallowed our entire spring or first half of summer or whatever you want to call it in our our short seasons here, but I am so thankful that Clay is here and able to do a lot of this stuff because a lot of it I simply cannot do. I can't dig through it, and so it has been really exciting to get a lot of this stuff protected. As you can see, we've been working till very late at night, uh, after dark most evenings, and it's made some very, very long days and uh, been rather exhausting. Even as I was finally putting this together, Clay said, boy, rewatch doing the work is exhausting. 
So that uh, is, is very nice to be on top of finally, and I think doing this into the future um, before we plant new things seems to be working. So hopefully some of the info in this video is helpful if you're one of the handful of other people in a climate where quackgrass is so invasive and will try to kill everything. We hope our experiences and trials and lots of errors are possibly helpful to making you have a little less of that so in your explain life. Explain to me how you're rescuing every tree and bush on the place. Well, this is uh, one of the last places that uh, we planted four years ago, and uh, it's the uh, last area to get cleaned up, and so trying to remove all the uh, quack grass, which we've been over many times. That's a quack grass root right there and very evil evil stuff sends out rhizomes and but at this point it's uh, just a lot of work and uh, <clears throat> one piece at a time and um, so what's your method when you come up to a new this is the last one and I failed to get any of the rest filmed before this you come up to a new tree or bush and what do you do well, when I get to the bush, I go around it, clean out, you know, back about a foot, 10 inches. And then I go through and do it by hand at the base of it to get the quack grass that went into the plant. And what it does is those roots will go around the uh, root system on the plants and uh and strangle the plant some of the roots will actually go right through uh you know a plant stock or a root um it's just uh you know it's a slow process but once you get it cleaned around the tree then you can start uh you know removing the bulk of uh you know the sod and it has to be taken out completely and then this area here was already done um, but, uh, and then I watch it for a little bit to see if anything pops up and, uh, like a to... mist root because yeah. quackgrass will regenerate from any little section of root that's left. Yeah. It'll generate from a piece of root that's a half inch long or less, and it'll send up a, uh, new piece of grass. Um, and then the sod that's getting taken out, it's going in your favorite electric four wheeler or electric wheelbarrow is what we use it as. And that is all going into a big pile that over time will break down as you roll it over and over and be wonderful topsoil to use for other things. Yeah, I don't even try to shake the, the dirt out of it. I just stick the, the sod and throw it up in there. This is a real good one to see all the quack grass roots. And if you notice on here, there's points on the end of this stuff as it's traveling underground. And it will, you know, I know a lot of people say, oh, that grass can't do that. It'll go right through a chunk of wood. And uh, uh, here's another good one that's got new baby points coming off it. So it was about to send out, it yep. was sending out multiple new yep. runners. That was probably the main feed right there sent the grass up and then and these are sharp these are actually sharp the points on that but they and, don't uh, stab your hand but they'll poke right through plastic potato roots tree trunks it's so evil i think um i mean there could be an argument made that uh this stuff was man-made or something that you know something that is that evil um only man could do that i just don't know. I don't have enough bad to say about the, the grass. <laughs> and originally when I was trying to weed before we knew how quackgrass worked, I would try to shake all the sod off of, you know, or all the dirt off of every chunk of sod and keep it there. And um, that was just a, a waste of effort. So now it's all going in a pile. If a plant's a little low in soil, we get some other screen topsoil from an older pile of this stuff or add some compost or something. But you can kind of see how the grass grows roots so thick. If I can get an angle here and show you how it's raised itself. Um, so that 
bush was not planted, the base of it right here was not planted way below the soil level. And it's a good bit uphill to where Clay's shoveling that sod off. Um, it just makes such a root mat that it actually raises the ground. So, you've done this around approximately now 70 something trees and a whole lot more bushes. Yep. This is the last one. It's the last area. We have still one, two, three, four more plants to uh, dig around. But all right here. Yeah. We're now doing at least like a 10 by 10 square around anything we plant. So with the plant being in the middle of that, so you've got at least five feet in all directions around it. And, um, and then Clay's, I'll show you our whole process for doing this. But that seems to be working. Having all these plastic squares around is not exactly pretty, and, and plastic stripes, you can see under the fence there. If you watch the video where we put that up, we put that plastic down right when we put up our cross fence that keeps the chickens out of the garden. Um, that was last summer, so the grass died under there, so this spring we were able to go through and plant raspberries. And I have some strawberries along part of it. I need to get finished transplanting more strawberries. Eventually there'll be raspberries on both sides of that fence. You won't be able to see the fence. That's the idea, but... Um, Anyway, we're down to the last few orchard trees, so I wanted to show you this seems to be working. Our oldest test on this is over a year old. We have not had grass come back in or kill anything that we've got protected in this fashion. And the things we have got protected have grown exponentially faster than their similar sized or identical plant neighbors when we, we get one area done and not the other because it's time consuming. And eventually this plastic will break down. I'm not sure how many years it will hold up. Um, it's a UV resistant. This stuff is called ag bag. That's the term I know. It's agricultural plastic. It's what you have put silage in and so on. That's what I'm familiar with it at. And I'll link to the company below that we've got it from. They sell it in varying lengths and such. So we've gotten quite a bit from them. But this is how we install a piece around an individual tree or bush. So if... Uh, this is much easier done when there's not wind, which has been difficult this spring. Usually we have a couple windy days in the spring, but we've had a couple windy weeks this spring. And yes, I know a lot of Wyoming is really windy, but our corner is not normally here stuck in the mountains. So if Clay's ready, we'll show you our process here. This is pretty near impossible to do with a single person, especially if it's not windy a day, but the, you pull out a piece of plastic and there will always be a faint breeze, I can assure you. So this stuff is opaque, it's 100% light blocking. Um, it's white on one side, as you can see, and black on the other. And this square is... If you don't do this and even to get it laid out, you gotta usually have something to hold all the edges and corners. But this is one of the few pieces we've done that's not actually square because we, square would leave us a little gap between our raspberry piece and the apple tree. We don't wanna maintain one little stripe of grass in between there. So this is a little bit of a rectangle. Does it need to come more this way? I think we could, yeah. So too. How much of an overlap do you think we want? Like that? Yeah, it don't really matter. We want to keep it pretty close to what we... Looking square there. Yeah, so maybe even a little bit more. When you're lapping two pieces of plastic, we learned you need to have a, a sizable overlap or the grass will crawl through one side and back out the other and go right back to growing. It's very, very aggressive. I have never encountered a weed like this in my life. So we lay out our square where we want it. And then from one side, we make a, a slit to the center. straight-ish line if possible. I need another weight.
centered in it approximately. None of this is a precise science. Kind of try to make it look square-ish with all the other pieces here in the orchard. And with our cold climate, we are definitely going black side up, which that's not quite square, is it? Not really. It could come this way. No. Um. Now that looks pretty good. You may want to choose something different if you had a very cold climate, but we want to cook the grass to death under here. Plus. It actually, I think, is providing a little advantage. We're keeping the soil a bit of a microclimate under there. It does retain moisture as any moisture that tries to evaporate. We have a very dry climate. It seems to come up, hit the bottom of the plastic, and rain back down into the soil. And we've definitely seen improved microbes and earthworms under the plastic. I think because it stays a little warmer, um, we can get frost and freezes year-round here. So this is our way to keep it from blowing away which of course is a big problem when you have big chunks of plastic. At every corner, mark where the corner is gonna be. And then Clay digs what I can't dig. I cannot dig through this stuff. I can jump up and down on the shovel and I can't get the shovel through it. Its roots are a very, very aggressive mat. Um, anyway, we haven't had any pieces that have been in the ground over a year blow away with this method. How big would these chunks you're taking out of the quarter? How much do they weigh? Um, they're pushing a hundred pounds. So we've got seventy-five to a hundred pounds. Something like a hundred pound weight growing back in place on each corner. I'll show you how we do this. Anyway, so the plastic is useful for doing multiple other microclimatey things here. If you were in a super hot climate where you don't get freezes most summer nights and you don't get snow in June and sometimes July and August. You may overheat your soil if you did a black side up. Of course, if you live in those climates, you would not have quackgrass because it likes cold places, but this may work for other kinds of invasive-ish weeds. I don't know, but it definitely has been working for this, and it's really the only thing we have found that does. So that comes out usually as one whole triangle. Let me grab my gloves. But if you are doing this in a warmer climate, especially a hotter one, you may actually sterilize your soil if you did a black plastic side up. Um, we don't have that issue here. So it's just benefiting everything. In fact, for a little bit, the grass will grow more aggressively under here because it's protected from the weather. How do you do that? that way a little more? No. That's the first time that's happened. I'm not sure nothing's moved, right? I don't think so, because it's pretty well weighted. Um, if you, the square you can get these corners, uh, you know, held down, the better it withstands blowing away over time. Most of the time, most of the year, it's fairly calm here in between which we can occasionally, fortunately we don't get twisting winds normally, but we can get straight line gusts. Of, I think our neighbor said he measured 100 mile per hour at one point. One we storm. haven't seen that, but it can happen. That one that shook the shop door like it was going to take it out might have been. We didn't have a gauge on it, but we occasionally, you know, you can put down something that'll stay put for eight months and then you get a single storm that tears it away. So the... Uh, the getting it to stay in place long term can be a little bit of a change. So Clay makes this kind of vertical wall you can see right here on the edge. And then we use enough chunks to 
to hold the plastic fully down so the plastic is doing this kind of shape. And then we drop this giant triangle back in, which is a lot of weight. We do it upside down because we don't need that grass, which is going to grow back on the corner, uh, to have any help doing it any faster than it otherwise would. And then Clay does all the hard work and kind of breaks up the, the sod so we get it really packed down in there. And we do this on all four corners normally. One advantage of having these sod chunks over the corners and um, having them packed down the level is when you go to mow and such around here, you can go right over that corner without catching the plastic. It makes it easier to turn versus having square corners. So once we have one corner set, then we can go from there and I will actually cut a circle out right where the tree trunk is going to be. There. See, and that even changed this. Like that. that looks pretty good. I think the camera missed quite having fully in the picture we did on the other side. We've got our corner, and yes, I know you don't leave your forks laying tines up, but we are using them as weights and you can't put them tines down without um, poking holes in our plastic. And any little pinhole, grass will come straight through. seems like the more vertical this wall is that he's digging right now, the more securely the plastic gets tucked straight down in there, and therefore the better it holds. Here we're tucking the dirt or the plastic in place vertically down into this dirt hole. And then we'll drop our 100 pound sod block triangle back in. And then upside down, we have an incredible amount of earthworm activity everywhere we dig in this soil, which is pretty cool to see. Now Clay's going to pack it down in there to be sure it can't, the plastic can't pull back out from it. And then we just repeat this on every corner of every tree and every bush and everything else on the property. All new plants that we plant into the future are getting a chunk like this. We did some new bushes and trees this spring. We did this from the start, so we'll never have them choked and being outcompeted and killed from the start. But we are almost done protecting the older stuff that we had planted before we knew how crop grass worked. And that gets packed in there, it's ground level, you can walk over it, you can mow over it, etc. Which is very convenient. And this is what the whole orchard is looking like. We're down to doing our last two trees. There's now 18 trees in the orchard. Every one of them looks like this. Occasionally there's like in the center there, you see there's a stake. One was leaning a little, we had to support it, but most of them are straight. Every one has its own square of plastic. Then 
down this seam, we staple it in with these landscape staples, making sure it's overlapped right up to the tree trunk. This edge we're doing something a little bit different because we're meeting another piece of plastic, but we've done this in multiple places around the property now. And there, we just tuck it in flat, making sure again that there's a, a good overlap. And staple them together. Magically, wherever you put a staple, it's kind of like driving tent pegs or anything else, there will be a rock wherever you first try to shove it in. Yep. And this, I don't know how well the camera's showing it, but the, the plastic generally drains a little bit toward the center. Um, Get that pliers. If we tuck that, this didn't seem quite snug. Um, so when you water it or it rains, the water does still drain in there and water the tree because this is not a water permeable plastic by any means. It, uh, water will pond on the surface and not go through. And if you really want to hold the edges down, dropping something heavy and flat edged like a steel T-post is very, very helpful. you got to be a little cautious of any lump of dirt or anything that makes a point under here. Because like I said, anywhere you get a hole through the plastic, grass will come right back through. How much work would you say this is compared to if we were planting an orchard where there was not back grass? It's double the work. I think it's way more than that, isn't yeah, it? That's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's many times the effort to plant anything. I mean, it doesn't even have to be an orchard. Any ornamental bush or tree or anything. The only way it'll be worth it is if this actually works and we don't have any more problems. But. We've literally spent hundreds of hours trying to keep the quack grass out of there. I think between us now, thousands. Thousands, yeah. Over four years, we've spent thousands of hours doing things that at first that were completely ineffective. Um, trying to weed grass, which did not even last. I mean, it felt like by the time I turned around, it was growing back thicker than it had before I weeded trying the little cute square uh, circles of plastic, which was great, but when you have stuff that'll run two feet under things and still come up, they're not effective. But you do have to tack the edges down because we need it to be a blackout under there so that there is no light or the grass will just keep growing. Now this will die from our, our tests. It will take about a full year. That's what we found. Yep. It'll be weak after a few months. Not days or weeks like most things, but a few months. But to be fully dead under a chunk like this, um, this has to be in place for at least a full year. So that's what we're doing. And it's the first thing we've done that seems to work over the course of a year. The grass has not come back through. So if you have quack grass, maybe that's helpful. We had so much of this stuff, I did not grab my camera to film it most of the time, but here's another instance where you can see grass roots not only circling around something like a um, iris, but going clean through it. Look at that. 
So once again, hopefully some of our experiences here are helpful to anyone else who may be trying to grow a garden or plants or trees where quack grass lives because um, I've been gardening my whole life. Clay's gardened in many places as well and this is the most challenging thing I have ever encountered in trying to grow any kind of plant in my lifetime. So that's where we're at right now. Thanks for spending your valuable time with us. I hope you learned something interesting and useful. Or found something beautiful here.